Welcome to our 5 p.m. service. Uh, for this week and next week, we're going to be having our services online. Uh, so you'll be able to watch the live stream at 8.30 and then uh, the sermon at 5 p.m. this week and next week. Um, today, we're going to be looking at Psalm 113. So open up Psalm 113 and I'll read it for you. Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over over all the nations, His glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high? Who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of their people. He settles the barren woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Our great God, we come before you humble in your presence, acknowledging that you are with us, And it is so good to know this, that you are a shepherd, that you care, and that you are with us. We pray now as we sit under your word, God, please grow us. Please transform us. Help us to be a people who would follow you and honor you with our lives. And we pray, God, particularly now that you would open our eyes to see you in your majesty and to see you, God, for who you really are. Please, God, work in us. Change us by your Spirit and open our eyes to see wonderful things, we pray. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We need to know God. There is nothing more urgent for you at this time than for you to know God. You may think your work pressures are urgent, your family struggles are great, that there's impending disease or that that upcoming exam is urgent, but they pale in urgency compared to the desperate need we all have to know God. Let me help you see this right at the beginning. We need to know God. You need to know God because He is the creator of this world. J.I. Packer says, We are cruel to ourselves if we try to live in this world without knowing about the God whose world it is and who runs it. It would be like taking someone who's only ever lived in the jungle and then dumping them in the middle of Sydney and just leaving them there with no explanation. That is what it is like to live this life without God, without knowing Him. You also need to know God because everything is permeated by God. God is all in all, says 1 Corinthians 15. Romans 11.36 says, From Him, through Him, and to Him are all things. To God be the glory forever. Amen. You also need to know God because to know Him is eternal life, says John 17, verse 3. When we come to truly know God and be known by Him, we have eternal life and fullness of joy. Also, you need to know God because to truly love God, you must know His beauty and be compelled by it to love Him. We also need to know God to be able to trust Him Psalm 9 verse 10 says, those who know your name will trust you. Do you wonder why you struggle to have faith in God? Because you don't know His character and you don't trust His character because you don't know Him. Faith can come when we know God and so if you want to grow your faith, get to know God. Also, you need to know God. We need to know God to be humbled. We need to know God so that sin is revealed and so that we know who we are. That's what happened for Isaiah when he saw that vision of God in his holiness. He came to see and say that he's cursed and that he has unclean lips. And we need to know who we are. And Calvin says that we will never know who we are until we know who God is. That's why we need to know God. We also need to know our God, finally, because, because when we do, everything changes. 
when we know God, we find a foundation to stand upon in our trials. Service for God's kingdom will spill over in our lives. Obedience, Christ-likeness will flourish in us. Our witness and burden to spread God's kingdom will grow. A hunger to worship God will form and so much more. So we need to see who God is. This will be worth more than anything. It'll be worth more than getting a good ATAR or having a thriving business or having acceptance among your friends, being successful. It'll be worth more than finding a stunning boyfriend or girlfriend or having a wonderful family. It will be worth more than all of these things. Knowing God will do more for you now and into eternity than anything else could ever do. And you need to realize I'm not just talking about a knowledge knowing here. Seeing who God is isn't enough. We, we would all say that we know the Prime Minister, but we don't actually know Him relationally. And our knowing of God needs to go beyond knowing about Him, knowing things about Him. Our knowing of God needs to be intimate and relational, where our knowledge of Him causes a deep trust in Him. So I want to deepen how we know God tonight. We will do it as we journey through this psalm, but also as we look at one key word in this passage that brings out some of the greatest realities about God. So let's look at this psalm now. The first point we see in our psalm, verse 1 to 3, we see that Yahweh is to be praised. The psalm begins and ends saying, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The Bible is always showing us that God is to be praised because of who He is and what He has done. God is worthy of praise. Just like when we cheer a sports team because of something that they've achieved and they're worthy of that praise. Well, this psalm calls us to praise God because He is worthy of it and we are going to see it particularly in verses nine, uh, verse 4 to 9. That's why God is to be praised, because of His character that we will see in verse 4 to 9. And that's why in verse 1 to 3, three times it says, praise the name of the Lord. Back then, someone's name described their character and who they were. And we are to praise God because of who He is. But also, in this passage, there is one word in this psalm, which in particular shows why God is to be praised. It's used eight times in this psalm, and it's used over 6,800 times in the Old Testament. I want us to spend a little bit of time understanding this word before we get into the rest of the psalm at the end of the sermon. Which word is it? Well, in your Bible, it's the word LORD in capitals. L-O-R-D, Lord in capitals. As you know, in the Bible, Lord in capitals is referring to the personal name of God, Yahweh. Yahweh. Yahweh isn't a title for God. We're not calling Him the Lord or Master, but it is, it's His personal name, and there's so much to learn from it. It's such a rich name with so much rich meaning. And to truly understand it, to truly understand His name, we need to go back to Exodus chapter 3, verse 13 to 15. Flick back there if you want to. Exodus chapter 3, verse 13 to 15. Here we see when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, He told Moses to tell the people of Israel that He is going to rescue them. And Moses asks, when He says this, Exodus 3, 13, Suppose I go to tell the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is your name? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. God says here to Moses, I am 
who I am. There is no other way to describe the full depth of God. God is who He is. God is God. There is none like Him. But there is more to what God is saying about Himself here. I am is the verb to be. It is a verb of existence and being. God is saying here in His verb that He is the uncreated being. He has no origin. He derives from nothing. Instead, God is. As John Piper says, God absolutely is. He's the ever-existent one. God is the self-existent one. This is what is meant when God says, I am. And also, this comes out of the name Yahweh. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 15, God calls himself Yahweh which we are to connect with the meaning I am. Why is this? Why should we connect it to that? Well, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14 to 15, God uses both of those things interchangeably. He says in verse 14, I am has sent me to you. Say this, Moses, I am has sent me to you. And then he says to Moses in verse 15, say, Yahweh has sent me to you. They're used interchangeably. Also, Yahweh, God's personal name, is built from that verb, to be, which is just like I am. And it is showing that God is the existent one who causes all to be. The word Yahweh is actually the third person masculine singular version of that root verb, to be. And so Yahweh could be translated, He is. And then finally, a final reason why we should think this is because God began in verse 14 in response to Moses' question of what is your name by saying, I am who I am. That's how he began, saying this is my name. And these three evidences here show that the name Yahweh has the meaning I am, or I am who I am. Yahweh is the God who is. Yahweh is the eternally existent one. He exists. He always has. He always will. We see this again and again in the Bible. Isaiah 43, verse 10 to 11 says, Before me, there was no God who was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me, there is no Savior. Or Isaiah 44, verse 6 says, This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. He says, I am the first, and I am the last. Apart from, me, apart from me, there is no God. There is none before God. None after Him. He is the first and the last. God was, God is, and God always will be. That's how John says it in Revelation. Chapter 1, verse 8, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Lord Almighty. And then in Revelation chapter 22, verse 13, it says the same about Jesus, showing Him to be Yahweh, the true God. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. God is the beginning and the end. There was nothing before God, nothing after God. In Greek, Alpha is the first letter of the alphabet. Omega, as you know, it's, it's the last letter of the alphabet. There's nothing in our alphabet before A. There is nothing after Z. So no matter where you go in this universe, God is saying, no matter how far you go back in history, no matter where you go into the future, or where you go into this world, there is God. He was, He is, He is to come. A.W. Tozer says about this idea, he says, before Abraham was, God was. And before Adam was, God was. And before the world was, the stars, the mountains, the seas, the rivers, the plains, or the forests, God was. And God is. And God will ever be. God is the originating self. God's selfhood is His holy being. His unsupported, independent existence. One of the most vital things that we can say 
about God, about Yahweh, is that He is. Yahweh is. This is referring to the supreme reality of His self-existence. It is something that is so huge that changes everything. It should shock us. It should knock us back, fill us with amazement. If it doesn't, as we look at this and His character, if it doesn't, something is wrong with us. You're failing to see God for who He is. Don't box God into your neat, simple understandings of Him. He's so much greater. And oh, if we would see God for who He is, everything would change. That we would see that Yahweh is the eternally existent one. So let's try to do that. I want us to try and see what is God's self-existence. I want to give us eight things that are meant by this. What does God mean when He calls Himself Yahweh? I am. What is His self-existence? Well, firstly, it means that Yahweh was, is, and always will be alive and infinite. God says, I am. I exist I've always been. I always will be. I'm alive. I'm infinite. Before this world, there was God. He never had a beginning. He was not made. He didn't originate from something. Instead, He is and always was. And He will never have an end as well. There will never be a time where there will not be God. And He's everywhere. In all this world, in all of history, in the future, everywhere. God is alive and infinite. Secondly, we mean by this that Yahweh was, is, and always will be the same. God doesn't change. He says back in Exodus 3, I am who I am. He cannot be improved because there's nothing better than Him. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, says Hebrews 13.8. Also, we mean by this, thirdly, that Yahweh was, is, and always will be incomparable. He's unmatched. There's nothing like God. No one like God. He alone is God. No one and nothing compares to Him. Everything we know, everything we know is nothing compared to God. Nothing is greater than Him. He's the eternally existent one. Also, we mean by this, fourthly, that Yahweh was, is, and always will be the sovereign ruler. He's above all, completely free. He's not bound by anything, not bound to anyone, and He always does what's right. Romans eleven thirty four says, Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been His counselor? The answer is, no one. Romans 9, verse 18 says, God has mercy on whom He wants to have mercy, and He hardens whom He wants to harden. God can do whatever, whenever, however, and with whomever He pleases, because He is God. If only we would see this about God. It would answer so many of our questions that we so often have about Him. Next, what do we mean here by God's self-existence, that He is? What do we mean? or Yahweh was, is, and always will be, self-sufficient. God doesn't need anyone or anything. Acts 17, verse 23 to 25 show this. Romans as well, 11, verse 35 says, Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? No one has. God doesn't have needs. He doesn't depend on something else for his existence. He is self-sufficient the very nature of being God. If God was dependent on someone else or something else, He would be a creature. He would not be the Creator and He would not be God. Instead, everything besides God depends on God. We, we are fragile, we are weak. We're nothing like God, nothing without Him and utterly dependent on Him. Six, what do we mean by God's self-existence, that He is? What do we mean behind this name, Yahweh, I am? Well, God was, is, and always will be the source of life and truth. As we've been saying, there's no existence outside of God. No life outside of Him. Apart from God, if He wasn't there, nothing would exist. 
as well. Justice, love, what is true, what is right. They are all defined by God and derive from Him. What we're saying here is that God is the cause of all things and He is uncaused, as Tozer says. Everything stems from God and He derives from nothing. He is the existent one who eternally exists and nothing can exist outside of Him. And Tozer says this as well. He says, Because God is, everything else that is, is. There's nothing that exists outside of God. Seventh, we mean that God was, is, and always will be worthy of all. Because God exists, He is the self-sufficient, always existent one. Because of this, because of all that we have seen so far, He is worthy of everything. Because from Him, through Him, and to Him are all things. He's worthy of your entire life. He's worthy of all your devotion. He's more worthy of your devotion than you giving that devotion to anything else. So praise Him. As the psalm calls us back in Psalm 113, live for Him, glorify Him. This is the nature of our God. This is why verses 1 to 3 in our psalm call us to praise Yahweh. Because this is what we mean when we say Yahweh. This is what is behind the God who is. And then finally, what do we mean when we say God is the self-existent one that He is? We, We mean this, that God was, is, and always will be worth more than all. That's the implication of all that it means. We need to see the infinite value and worth of God. Nothing is more valuable or more important than Him, than the self-existent eternal God. So we must come and treasure Him, hunger for Him, and seek to gain Him. These things that we've seen, this is what it is to be God. This is what God's self-existence means. And it is implied behind God's name, Yahweh. God was, God is, And He always will be. He exists. Nothing is greater than this. This truth must transform us. It's a staggering reality. And if we aren't living in light of this breathtaking view of God, then we need to come broken before God because of the sin of trying to be the God of our own life when He alone is God. We need to submit to Him, knowing He's worthy of all and He is worth more than all we could ever hope for or find in this world. Because Yahweh is. He is who He is. He's the eternally existent one. But there's something else in the name Yahweh. Another key truth in the name Yahweh, which was mentioned eight times in Psalm 113, that we need to understand. And it's this. The name Yahweh also shows the personal nature of God. God is relational. He is present. He comes using the name Yahweh as He makes promises of covenant with His people. He does this, showing His personal nature. If you flick back, back in Exodus 3, verse 7 and 8, God says, I have seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them. It's incredible. Here we see Yahweh. He hears, He sees, He knows, He has concern, and He cares and acts and speaks for Moses to go. God has a personal nature. And then just a few verses after this, after God God revealing this personal nature about Himself, this relational nature in Himself, He then reveals and says His name, Yahweh, connecting this to His personal nature. And not only this, but Israel also knows Yahweh as a personal God. He has a personal history with Israel. He's the one who's made covenant with them before. And He's the faithful God. He's been faithful to their fathers. 
Exodus 3 verse 15 says, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. So behind this name here, we're seeing the personal, relational aspect of God and that He is faithful and keeps covenant. That's what's behind the name Yahweh. And also in Exodus, a bit later in Exodus 6, verse 2 to 8, when God comes to promise deliverance to the Israelites, He says, I am Yahweh. And then He promises and does what He does. And also in Jeremiah 31, when He makes that new covenant promise, He refers to Himself as Yahweh. Because the name Yahweh shows the personal nature of God, His faithfulness, and that He will keep His covenant promises because He is the self-existent One, the all-powerful One that we just saw before. And so when we put all of this together, we see here two great and awesome things about God that are seen in His name, Yahweh. We've seen His incomparable greatness, His absolute self-existence that He was, He is, and He is to come. I am who I am. He says, but also in the name Yahweh, we see the personal nature of God and that he has a caring covenant relationship with his people and he's faithful to his people. One author says about this, he sums it up so well. He says, God packs the weightiest truth about himself into a personal name. Infinite greatness and personal knowability are in the name Yahweh. And I bring all of this up and bring all of this out of the name Yahweh, which came in Psalm 113, because it fits so well with the rest of the psalm. I know you're probably thinking, I've dealt too much with the name Yahweh and I haven't got to the psalm much, but it fits so well with what we see in the rest of the psalm. And it is such a key thing to understanding God. Understanding His personal name, Yahweh, is so key. And the two things we've seen about Yahweh, His name, fit perfectly with the final two things we see in this psalm, in Psalm 113. Back in Psalm 113 here, we see that Yahweh is exalted above all things and that He is a God who comes near, who comes down and cares. On their own, both of these things are incredible. The the exalted nature of God, the caring nature of God, these are incredible things. But when these two things come together, they're amazing. And they're even more exalted. So let's briefly now look at these two things at the end of Psalm 113. And they will both as well give us further reason for why we are to praise God. If you remember back to the beginning of the sermon, back to the beginning of the psalm, we said that first point is that Yahweh is to be praised. Verse 1 to 3 show Yahweh is to be praised. And we, we saw why Yahweh is to be praised because of His name and what it means, what Yahweh means. But we see here two more reasons why Yahweh is to be praised. And so we we get to the psalm here. We've seen, firstly, Yahweh is to be praised. Secondly, we see, verse 4 to 6, Yahweh is exalted. Verse 4 to 6, have a look. It says, verse 4, The Lord is exalted over all the nations. His glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high? Who stoops down to look on the heavens? And the earth. God is lifted up. There is none like him, as we've been saying. He looks down over all things, stoops down to look on the earth. His glory and who he is is beyond everything. And so, your family, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your favorite interest, your best achievement is nothing, absolutely nothing compared to God. And you are nothing compared to God. I know we don't like to hear that. I know we struggle to think that about ourselves. We think we're so good, but we're nothing compared to God. If only our view of God wouldn't be so small, if our view of God God wasn't so small, we would see we're nothing compared to Him. And we would be in awe of Him with a life overflowing in praise. So verse 4 to 6 so clearly show that God is exalted He's beyond us. He's beyond compare. He's like no other. And yet, 
verse 7 and 9 show he's the God who comes near. He's beyond. He flung stars into space. He created everything we see, and yet he comes near. Have a look. Our third point we see, verse 7 to 9, Yahweh is near. Verse 7 to 9. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of their people. He settles the barren woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. God is so beyond us, and yet He comes near and He cares. This sums up so much of His character. He's tender, caring. He's in our lives. He's loving. He cares here, we see in the verses, for the poor, for the needy, for the barren. He takes those who are in misery and he lifts them up to a place of blessing. He lifts the poor and the needy and seats them with the princes. Verse 7 and 8 say, He lifts up the barren woman. He settles the barren woman, making her a happy mother of children. We see here, there's there's nothing too great for our God. And there is no one too small for His tender care. These are wonderful pictures of God's personal love. Though He's majestic, though He's beyond us, He's not absent from our lives and He cares. And He is like this as well. This deep, tender care is shown to us who are spiritually poor, to us who are sinners, in need of Him. Those who are in the ashes of guilt because of the depths of their sin, those burdened by the weight of their offense towards God, those deep in sin, God is like this. God is near. God is ready and He comes to forgive. He's near us. He's made a way for us to dwell with Him forever through His Son. Yahweh, He came down to this world, took on flesh. God's Son, who is fully God. Jesus, whose name means that Yahweh saves, came to die. He came to save His people from their sin. And Jesus blew up that gigantic chasm that was between us and Yahweh. He made a way so that we, in our great need, in our sin, could have what we most need, Yahweh. Eternity with God. If you don't have this, come to Him. Put your faith in Christ. Put your faith in Yahweh who can save. Get off the throne of your life. Get off the throne. Stop thinking you are God. It's a place reserved for God alone, for Yahweh. And turn from your sin. Bank all your hope on the truth that Yahweh came took on flesh, died in your place. Know and believe that. You can have the forgiveness of sin. Don't wait. If you haven't done that, do that now. Don't wait another night. And may all of us as well know here from all of this, that this is our God. The God that we have seen here, this is our God, Yahweh. What a God we can know. What a God we can praise and should praise. He's exalted above all, exalted above everything, and yet He comes near to us. He's self-sufficient, ever-existent, incomparable, and yet He sees, He hears, He cares, and He comes down to His people in need. He spoke all into existence. He's a God who spread the stars in the space like a curtain, and yet He breathed His dying breath on the cross for us. This is our God, Yahweh. I am who I am, He says. May everyone who knows His name, who knows who He is, put their trust in Him. And may everyone everywhere praise Yahweh, for He is worth more than anything. And He is worthy of your everything. This is our God. This is the God we trust. This is the God we follow and put our faith in and our hope in. This is the God we praise. Our God, Yahweh. Let's pray.
great God, what an awesome thing it is to know you. We have so much to learn. There is so much to grow in. Please keep teaching us. Please keep opening our eyes to the depths that are in you. And as you do this, God, transform us. Show us who we are. Show us the depths of our sin and transform us so that we live lives that would honor you and glorify you and so that we would overflow in praise to you as we see you and who you are and also transform us so that we overflow with a hunger to spread your glory to others, to exalt you to other people who do not know you as the God who has come near, who took on flesh, Jesus, your son, who died in our place. If there are any around us who do not know God, raise us up for this and cause us to be a people who are transformed by the truth that you are the ever-existent one and you come near and you save us. Please, God, grow these things in us more this week. Help us to think on this more and transform us by all that we know and by all that we've heard. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.